Hey everybody, happy Thursday. Hope you're doing well. Hope this finds you, everybody doing healthy, are, you being, are, are healthy, safe, and, and enjoying what is um, crazy enough to say June and summertime already. So, uh, hey, look, a couple things. One, um, I know it's that time of year, so you got graduations, whether it be college, high school, you know, matriculating from middle school to high school. So congratulations to everybody out there who's going through that. It's a great time. Uh, and, and then also, um, for everybody joining today, or if you see this as a recording, I know Father's Day is coming up, uh, on Sunday. So happy Father's Day to everybody out there. And, um, and just wanted to kind of make sure I threw that out there, especially if you're, uh, remembering somebody that, you know, a father that may have passed recently or in the past, obviously keep those you know, good thoughts and memories in, 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 in you know, with you that day on, on this Father's Day coming up on Sunday. So happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Um, hey, look, it's our June Flex series. As always, trying to bring value to you, you know, from a standpoint of education, ideas, thoughts, just, you know, what's going on in the industry. Um, and so we appreciate you taking time to join us. And look, I'm always excited when we're able to you know, get this individual to come on with us. Uh, I've, I've known him for quite some time now. Uh, he's a tremendous supporter of, you know, mortgage. And then inside that specifically, the channel that we all operate in, right, which is third party uh, origination. Uh, and, and look, I'm pretty sure everybody knows him, but I'm going to give you a little bit of bio anyway, in case for some reason in this industry, you've only been doing it for a moment and you don't know who he is. So let me tell you a little bit about him real quick. I'll point out some uh, some highlights. So um, he's got a book called Money in the Streets, Amazon, number one, best-selling author for that book. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of things I could go down here because he does a lot in this industry, right? Um, but just give you some of the awards that he's been uh, bestowed and recognized for. So uh, named to the list of 100 people to watch in 2023. He was the St. Armand Ventures Business Fan of the Year in 2021. He was named to Mortgage Global 100 list. Uh, and then, look, I think a lot of people forget this because he's been doing it for a very long time. But before he does what a lot of people on this uh, you know, call will know him for, he was just like you. He originated loans, right? So in his career, he's originated over $2 billion, uh, in, in in production. I always love the, you know, learning things about him. And, and the interesting thing is, I knew uh, he was the lead producer and managing partner of Rock of All Ages, 27th longest running show in Broadway history, because I've said that before. I don't think I realized he was the produced Chris Angel's Mind Freak at Planet Hollywood in Vegas, um, which I thought was interesting. Because I don't know if I ever, actually, I ever knew that. Um, and look, he's widely seen on you know things like CNBC. He's called upon by numerous entities within the space uh, to give his expert analysis and feedback uh, and look, with that being said, if you don't know who it is, right, you should because we promoted it. It's Barry Habib, CEO of Highway AI. And obviously, you can see him on stage now. So, Barry, hey, welcome aboard, man. Glad you're here. My good friend, it's always great to be with you. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, you too, man. And look, I, I will start off with thank you. I always appreciate when our partnership, right, together, it goes back a long way. And you're just such a tremendous support for this industry and, and the segment that you know, we're talking to today, which is third party originators. So was really excited uh, to have you come on board. And look, Barry's going to talk about a couple of different things today. Right. Um, you know, and, and I think all timely and, and, you know, talking about, you know, things that were impacting us today, where our home price is going, near term housing forecast. What do you need to know about inflation and jobs and home sales and how does housing perform in a recession, right? So who better to have come on? I thought it was extremely timely with everything that's going on in the market to get Barry back on board with us. So Barry, I'll throw it to you. Oh, it's such a such a privilege to be here with you and with all of you amazing people that are out there working really hard. I know that right now it's a little bit of a trying time. So I want to talk to you today about what I would be doing if I were an originator, because just like you, I originated loans for a very long time. I did a little over $2 billion in personal production. That's me and one assistant. So it's not like anybody rolled up to me. Our loan balances were less when I was originating because my career was from the you know, mid to late 80s into the you know, middle of the 2000s period of time. So you know, a good chunk of time, saw a lot of markets, saw some markets that were great, but also saw some markets that were really challenging. So not 
unlike what you guys are going through. Had a mortgage company and we were a mortgage broker operations. So I very much can relate to, to where you are. So I want to talk to you about what I'd be doing right now. But here's the first thing I'm not going to be doing is I'm not going to be complaining about it because that's the easiest way to go. So you can either spend your time bitching, you could spend your time complaining, you could spend your time wishing, or you could spend your time doing something about it. Um, I understand that volume levels are far more challenging. I get that. But I just want to go over some stats right now with you, okay? In this market right now, there's going to be 4.2 million existing homes sold. There's going to be 700,000 new homes sold. So that's 4.9 million home sales that are taking place. Of that, 3.5 million will require a mortgage. So that's 3.5 million mortgage transactions on the purchase side that are going to happen. Refinances in this market, 7% rates or six and three quarters, whatever. 1.3 million refinances are being done. So don't tell me nobody's refinancing because 1.3 million people will tell you you're wrong. That's a total of 4.8 million transactions. Now, it's not 6 million transactions. It's not, you know, the numbers that we were accustomed to when it was 7 million transactions. No, it's not. However, there's still a lot of transactions. You don't need all of them, okay? That's the thing you have to understand. How many do you need? You know, if you do... If you do 25 of them, you're in the top 15% of all income earners in the United States, right? So what do you want to do? Do you want to do 25? you want to do 50? So if you want to do 50 transactions, you got to do one a week, which means that you don't need 4,799,950. Okay, you missed out on those. Get 50. And you make yourself over $200,000 a year. One a week. So what would I be doing if, if that were if I was in your shoes right now? If I'm out there originating loans, I'm going to get busy talking to everybody I could. So the first person I'm going to talk to is myself. Am I a master of my craft? Because before you could bullshit, you could just be a salesperson and deals are being thrown at you. But as you've discovered right now, it's a little bit different. So you have to fill the funnel, get more people to refer your business. So you have to create more value to them. So if you want to be more valuable to them, you have to be a master of your craft. That'll fill your funnel. And then once you get chances, you got to close those chances and you've got to create opportunities. So what do people need right now? Realtors need to understand how they can get that buyer to give up their 3% mortgage that they have if they have a 3% mortgage. Not everybody has one. About 23% of them do. But there's a lot of people, another 40% or so are between 3 and 4%. So there's a big chunk right between 3 and 4 So call it 3.5%. There's a lot of people in that range. How do I give up that three and a half percent rate and get something at around six and three quarters or so? That's that's a big jump. So I want to show you what I'd be doing right now to generate that and to show your realtors. What's going on with rates? Let's start with that. Now, we thought I thought that rates would start coming down much more significantly right around now. Right? But between the last three weeks to about now, I thought they'd start coming down. The reason I thought they'd start coming down, because I thought that inflation would start coming down. Well, guess what? We're right about the inflation part. The inflation part is coming down. Wrong about the rate part, at least right now. I was wrong about that because what we didn't see when we started to make these forecasts in December and January was due to the fact that... Yeah, I, I know I'm not sharing my screen, by the way. I got gotcha. you. That when we started making these forecasts in January or December of last year when we started formulating them, we did not see the banking crisis. That created an extraordinary event in our industry. And the debt ceiling created another extraordinary event. With those things subsiding, the debt ceiling is not totally behind us because while it's resolved, now there's new issuance of debt that's coming to marketplace because of it. And that's going to drain some liquidity. The banking crisis is not completely over. I'm going to explain what that's all about so you understand it. Eventually, eventually, team, the fundamentals will take over. And as inflation will continue to subside and come down, you will begin to see mortgage rates respond. We're headed for a recession. As we head to that recession, mortgage rates will come down. So, yeah, these two events definitely show that we were incorrect in our forecast for rates coming, starting to come down more meaningfully right now. We thought that sometime over the summer, we'd be in the fives, maybe in the five and a half percent range. So that means by now, we should have been in the mid to low sixes, not happening yet. 
but it will start to get better. Inflation numbers are continuing to come down, and that's the fundamental relationship that's out there. So in a way, it's a good thing for your buyer because if rates started to come down or when they do eventually come down, prices are going to escalate even hotter than they are right now. You already see what's going on. You see what's happening in the marketplace. So I'm going to share some slides with you. But what I want you to understand is this. What I'd be doing right now is I'd be making sure I was a master of my craft and I understood what people want to know. People want to know, is there a housing bubble? Because that's what the media is saying. People want to know where are rates heading? What's driving interest rates? What's the Fed's role in this? So I'm going to teach you a lot of that right now. But this is an ongoing thing that you have to make sure that you work on every day. And the other thing I want you to make sure you do is you get out there and make sure you're talking to real estate agents. I'm going to show you ways to do that in a meaningful way that creates value for them. Not just, hey, I'm Barry. Here's a bagel. Send me a loan. Okay, that's, that doesn't work. Let's narrow down the realtors who are doing business. We'll show you how to do that. But let's also make sure we give them something of value so that they want to do business with you because they want you in front of their customer to explain to them why right now is the opportunity they've been waiting for in housing. So with that, I'm going to share. Hey, Barry, while, while Barry's pulling it up, gang, remember, you can submit questions all along the way down below. And when they come through, we'll, we'll either get them as we're going or we'll get them at the end. And John, I imagine you could see my screen now, right? Yeah, we're good, Barry. Absolutely. So I do think this is the opportunity you've been waiting for. So listen, team, if you want a, you know, a screenshot to post here, there, no problem. But you can't just record the whole thing. Um, you get it. It's proprietary information. So there's a lot of negativity out there. And uh, I don't know if you saw the article in American Banker that says, is it time to quit mortgage and real estate? Really? Time to quit? Why? Because volume levels are down. And they talked about that. Yeah, we're down from the peak and down from year over year. We get that. Refis are down. Purchases are down. We understand that, but it is not time to quit, ladies and gentlemen. We know the fundamentals, and the fundamentals will return. That is, as inflation rises, mortgage rates rise. When inflation drops, mortgage rates drop. We had that happening, and inflation has started to drop, but mortgage rates haven't done what they always do. They started to drop with inflation, but then eh, banking crisis and the debt ceiling deal derailed the relationship for now, but the fundamentals will return. Look. We know this. We know that inflation drives mortgage rates. It always has. In the summer of 2021, the inflation numbers were very low. So as the inflation numbers came out in the summer of 2022, higher numbers replaced lower numbers. Inflation went up. Mortgage rates went up. But then in the fall of 2021, you had higher inflation. In the fall of 2022, the inflation numbers came down. So lower numbers replacing higher numbers. Inflation went down and mortgage rates went down in the fall of 2022. As we've gotten into 2023, for the first quarter, we kind of treaded water. But now we should be in a period where as the numbers are coming out for the second quarter, the higher inflation for 2022 should be replaced by lower inflation in 2023. But we're not seeing yet in rates because, as I mentioned, those extenuating circumstances. Now, why do we know inflation is going to come down? Because a big part of the CPI reading, the core CPI reading, is shelter costs. That's 43% of it. So this is going to drive a lot of what's going on. And as you can see, shelter costs were blistering hot. But now rents and owner's equivalent rents have really settled down quite a bit. They're only going up on a year-over-year -year basis, 1% on new rents. And if you blend them with existing renewal rents, about 4% year-over-year. So much less than the 15% that we were seeing or 18% that we're seeing. The problem with this is that it lags. And I'm sure by now you've heard comments about these lagging indicators. The Fed uses this stuff in CPI the way it's done. This was done, formulated 50 years ago. We have much better metrics now, but yet they haven't changed the methodology. So when you look at rents, what they do is they take the most recent rent the month before, the month before, they take the most recent 12 months and they average it. And that's why in real time, rents are going up modestly, but the way that it's measured in the CPI report, it shows that they're going up at 8% a year still. This is as of the report that we just got you know, on June the 13th, where we saw that you know, two days ago, we saw that CPI showed rents are going up at 8% a year. They're not. They're going up at a much lower level. Why? Because of the averaging effect. 
And this is what really was at the crux of all of the troubles that you have right now, the banking crisis, the inflation, the high rates. The Fed screwed this thing up because they look at the orange line and they look at the lagging average instead of finger on the pulse, real time what's happening. And this is how they got us into this mess. You know, when they were in mid-2021, virtually every Fed official was clamoring for we need more inflation. Inflation's too low. You might recall that. They were saying, hey, you know, we can average inflation to over 2%. You know, there's not enough inflation. We can't stop QE. We can't start hiking rates because we don't have This was just two years ago, team. And they were begging for more inflation. Janet Yellen, do you remember she was on TV saying, we've got to go big, more QE. This wasn't 20 years ago. It was two years ago. And they were begging for more inflation. Why? Because all of them were watching the orange line, which showed that inflation was low, weighted 43% of it by rents and shelter costs, which are only going up at 1.5% on a year-over-year basis because it averaged the previous year. What was happening in real time? This was happening in real time. Rents were going up at during this time, eventually 15 to 18 percent a year. But the Fed was watching this. So they're making the same mistake right now. Instead of looking at the real time line, they're looking at this and they're making policy decisions saying that inflation is too high because it's not coming down fast enough. It is. If they're patient, they'll come down. Now, the mistake that they made was during the QE period. They should have stopped here. They should have ended QE right there, and they should have started hiking rates modestly right here. But instead, they kept rates at zero, and they kept quantitative easing going. Now, at the time, that kind of felt good for us, no doubt about it. But really, what it did was it was like you know, like a partying too much and, and, and now creating yourself in a position instead of enjoying yourself responsibly, you're going to create a pretty bad hangover. And that's what we're suffering from now because the Fed did that. And then they fostered a lot more inflation. That's why you've got higher rates now, because the Fed's doing everything they can to fight the inflation that they caused. And the banking crisis, as I will explain to you in a little bit, was created because of the Fed. Now, yesterday we heard Chairman Jerome Powell say, hey, we've got to get to 2% inflation. And he has moved what he, like, first he says, well, we should look at headline inflation because that's what the customer feels. Then he said, well, We've got this new thing, this super core inflation, which is core inflation minus shelter because shelter legs. Now, yesterday, he starts to talk about we want 2% on core PCE. Well, I've got news for you. That's not easy to get. So 2% core PCE, just do the math. That means that if it's 2% year over year, each month has to average 0.16. Actually, it's a little less than that because there's some compounding, but roughly 0.16. And we haven't seen that number. Except for July of 2022, even in recent months, those monthly year-over-year readings are coming in higher than that. It's hard to get inflation that low. So this tells me the Fed is going to continue to make mistakes and keep rates too high or even potentially hike even further until something breaks. What's going to break? Well, the job market might break. The economy in general might break. And they're going to force us into a recession. I'm going to show you the results of recession in a moment. But first, let's talk about a crisis that they created, which is the banking crisis. So let's understand for a minute how the banking system works. And I think this is very instructive for you because very few people understand this. And so many people wonder what happened and they scratch their heads. And they maybe know a little bit about it. They hear, oh, yeah, SVB or you know, Signature Bank or First Republic. But they don't know what caused it. It was caused by the Fed. Here's how the banking system works. Let's say you got a couple of hundred thousand dollars and it's go back, wind the clock back to now 2022. You put that money in the bank. Anytime you put your money in the bank, even today, you're going to get a very low rate of return as a deposit, maybe like one tenth of 1%. So, for, you know, virtually nothing, a little tiny bit. Now, you're getting very little, but at the time, if you go back in 2022, there weren't that many alternatives. Money markets were also offering very little. Short-term safe bonds, very, very little. So you didn't have very many alternatives, so you just threw it in the bank. Well, what does the bank do when you put a deposit there? They have to take your money and put 10% and keep it in reserve. So if you give them $200,000, they reserve 10% or $20,000. The remainder, that other $180,000, the bank can use this 
to try and make a profit. And that's how banks make money. So how would they make a profit? They'll give you a home equity line of credit, a car loan, a personal loan, a commercial loan, a business loan, things like that. The one thing that's a little risky about those is that that money gets tied up. So if you said, hey, I want my money back because I want to pull my deposit, well, they only have 10% of it. So their other clients, they'd have to take those clients 10% and patch together your money to reimburse you. So if it's done here once in a while, no big deal. But they can't put all their money in these assets that are hard to get their money back from. So they'll do some car loans, some home ex, some personal loans, some business loans. But a lot of it, they're also going to do in things like mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. Why? Because the rate would still give them a profit. You know, it's not going to be as good as a credit card, a home equity line of credit, or a car loan, right? But you're still going to get a little bit, 2 or 3%, 4%. And if I'm paying a tenth of 1%, well, that's a pretty good deal. So that's what they did. The good thing about those is that if I need it, I could sell those treasuries or I could sell those mortgage-backed securities and I can make up your money if I need it. So it's a pretty good system. Well, what happened was that the Fed has gone bananas. In a year, the Fed's raised 500 basis points or 5% in a year, the fastest pace they've ever done this. So it's created an imbalance. And what happened was, was that you may have noticed this yourself. Hey, if I leave my money in a deposit, I get a 10th of 1%. If I go to a money market, which is also safe, I get 5%. So man, on $200,000, you're talking about real money here. Okay. You're talking about 800 bucks extra a month, 900 bucks a month. I'm going to do that. And here's what you see happening. The yellow line is deposit monies in the bank and it's been drawn out. Where are they putting it? Things like money market accounts. So this is your money markets. So they're just being smart consumers, taking it out of the account that give you a tenth of 1% and putting it in an account that's giving you 5%. Now, remember, money markets back here in 2022, they were also paying like a tenth of 1%. So it didn't pay to make a move. It was more convenient in the bank. You had more access to it. You could write checks against it. So that's why they did it that way. But because the Fed's gone crazy, they made the return on these higher and the money's flooding to this. So what does that mean if you're a bank? I got to give you back your money. I can't take it out of the car loans. I can't say, hey, I need the money back I lent you on your car loan. No, I, I need the money back on your commercial. They can't do that. So what are banks forced to do? They're forced to sell their treasuries and their mortgage-backed securities. Now, just like anything else, when you have an unusual amount of selling in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, selling is bad for pricing. Bad pricing is higher in rates. So this is why we have seen Inflation improve, but mortgage rates haven't improved because of the extraordinary selling. It's just like if you go back when the Fed was buying the market, they were doing an excessive amount of buying. Even though inflation was going up, mortgage rates stayed low because of the excessive buying. Now, what's happening is, is that there's excessive selling to raise capital to reimburse these depositors who are taking their deposit monies out. It's an important thing to understand this because eventually – this will exhaust itself. And I hope that this was helpful and clear to understand how this banking crisis is the Fed's fault, but also what happened and why some of these banks actually failed. Now, if you notice this big drop here when this all happened, this all happened during the month of March and April. And the FDIC had to seize the assets and the FDIC then started selling them in May, which obviously caused mortgage rates to not behave themselves very well in May. Now, Let's get back to the economy for a second and talk about what the Fed's also done it can hurt the jobs market. Now, the job market, many people think it's super strong. But what I'd like to do is kind of look at the future instead of look at the past. See, the Fed, they make these mistakes because they drive while they're looking in the rearview mirror. They're looking at old data. They're looking instead of looking at real time or trying to look forward. Wayne Gretzky became the greatest hockey player in all time because he said, rather than skate to where the puck is, let's skate to where the puck is going. The Fed doesn't even skate to where the puck is. They skate to where the puck was. So let's do a Wayne Gretzky here and let's see where's the puck going. On the jobs market, the Fortune 500 company CEOs in their conference calls mentioned job cuts more re most recently for the first time 
more than they mentioned labor shortage. See here, the job market labor's short. Nobody's cutting jobs. Now, more job cuts, more than labor shortage. This is a very good indicator that the job market is about to turn around. And if you want to know something that's going to cause mortgage rates to improve, it will be the job market printing a lousy report. And this is very important because so many people say, ah, you know, Barry, we can't have a recession because the job market is so strong. Well, when the unemployment rate is low, that's exactly when you get recessions. In 100% of the time over the past 100 years, if you take a look here, when the, when, when the unemployment rate is not high, it's, when it's at its lowest level and starts to turn higher, you get these shaded areas, which are recessions every single time over and over and over again. And here's where we are now. Sure looks to me like we're ripe for it. And just recently, the unemployment report showed the jobs report showed that the unemployment rate went from 3.4 to 3.7 percent. So it's turning. Typically, the barometer for this is about a half a percent off the bottom. So if that unemployment rate gets to 3.9 or 4 percent, that's what I'd be looking at as the trigger that we're about to enter a recession convincingly. And that's where you're going to see the job market break. Now, when you get into these recessions, the economy slows down because unemployment starts to really go up very rapidly during these periods. Why? Well, if you lose your job, well, then that means that you're going to hunker down in your shopping. And that means stores that were accustomed to you spending money will then have less business and they'll have to make up for it by letting more people go. And it becomes a snowball effect and that perpetuates. And that's why you see this kind of result. Fortunately for us in the mortgage business, recessions result in lower mortgage rates. So we're headed for a recession. And you can see all the last recessions, rates drop. And they drop significantly during each of the last recessionary periods. What does it mean for real estate, though? Is that bad for real estate? Because the media is going to say it's bad for real estate. Actually, it's not. Eight out of the last nine recessions, real estate values went up both during and after the recession. And when we take a look at it and we say, okay, why it does that happen? There's a simple reason for that. And that's because... Unfortunately, when we have a recession, the unemployment rate goes up and people lose their jobs. And that's awful, right? We feel for them. So they're probably going to be less eligible to buy a home. So if the unemployment rate goes up 1% and about a million five people are less eligible to buy a home, well, they come out of the pool of buyers. But as you saw in the previous slide, rates come down by 1% or more. For every 1% drop, then 5 million more people become eligible to buy. So not all of them will come will be will have been buyers, but the pool of eligible buyers increases by five million from the lower rate, while the unemployment causes it to decrease by one point five million. So the net result is about three and a half more people that are able to buy, and that's why housing does well. Okay, so what happened here? The great financial crisis. What happened during that period? During the housing bubble. Well, during the housing bubble, there was just simply too much supply, too many homes on the market and not enough demand. The way you measure supply is builders completing homes and putting them on the marketplace. That's supply. Demand is household formations. A household formation happens when you have mom, dad, and a child. They live in one household. At some point in time, that child reaches an age that they grow up and they move out. They get their own household. So now it's still the same family. It's still the same mom, dad, and a child, right? But that child, by now getting their own place, they formed a household. So they now have two households instead of one. And that's how you get a household formation. This next chart shows you for the last 20 years what's happened each year. The blue line's household formations. You see this in 2004. Builders completing homes was pretty close to that. So there was pretty balanced. Now, also another thing you have to know is every year, due to aging, about 100,000 homes have to be replaced. So builders actually have to build a little more to keep equilibrium. And they did that in 2004 and 2005. And the housing market was really hot. But then something crazy happened in 2006. What happened? Well, builders built more homes than they ever have in history. We haven't even come close to that. They built 2 million homes. We haven't even built a million and a half since then. But at the same time they were doing that, look what happened to household formations. It fell off a cliff. Big, big drop in household formations. Wow. This excess inventory created an imbalance. And then we had a similar situation in 07. Even though builders built less, household formations even dropped further. And now you had all this was excess inventory. And man, by 2008, <laughs> it was over. It was already a big housing bubble. Now, eventually things flattened out, but now we've had the reverse. 
now you have too many households being formed and not enough homes being built. That's why there's very little inventory. That's why homes are selling quickly. And that's why prices are rising. This is the situation we're in today. So if somebody says to you, oh, you know, prices have gone up of late. So that means there's going to be a bubble, right? Well, no, because if we understand what caused the bubble, we can see things are different today. So if we want to take a look at what caused this, well, we know that builders just built too many homes here. But what caused the drop in household formations? Will that happen again? Well, the median age of a first-time home buyer is 33 years old. So if you look at 2006 and say, let's look at the birth rates. Did the birth rates drop between these two years, which going back 33 years, that's 1972 to 1973. Did birth rates drop? Let's take a look. And sure enough, they did. Look at the birth rates in 1972. Big drop in 73, dropped again in 74, flattened out and went up. Hey, that looks a lot like the chart I just showed you. Big drop, drop, flattens out, goes up. It's amazing. And that makes sense because the corresponding, the drop here corresponds to 33 years later, more 33-year-olds or less 33-year-olds, depending on how many births 33-year-olds earlier. What caused this big drop? Well, there was a reason for it. It's because in 1973, by the way, when I give you this, please understand I'm not offering any opinions, okay? Everybody gets a little sensitive these days. So please understand this is just factual statistics that abortions were legalized. As a result, a lot less people were born. And the following year, as it followed through and carried over, you had even less births the next year and then before it flattened out and then started to grow again. So 33 years later, you had that result. Now, in 2023, we know how many homes builders are going to build because you can't just blink and put up a home. You know, there's planning, there's permits, there's, you, know, you got to see, do we have enough roads, schools, utilities, water, all that stuff. So, you know, for the next couple of years, how many homes are being built. And in 2023, there's going to be about 1.4 million homes being built. But remember, there's also going to be about 100,000 homes that are going to age and be replaced. How many household formations? Well, let's take a look because 33 years before 2023 is 1990. Let's look at the birth rates. Oh, big difference. Okay. So when somebody says it's a bubble, please understand that to just talk out of their rear end like that, it doesn't make sense. You have to look at the facts. Another big aspect is vacancies. Look, vacancy rates for homeowners and for renters were very stable for about 20 years. And then as the housing market got very hot in the early 2000s, People started buying homes not to rent, not to live in, but speculatively to flip. And that was because it was very easy to get a mortgage. The application was essentially, do you have a pulse or can you, can you breathe on this mirror and fog it up? Okay, you're approved because there was no income, no asset, no job, no, um, no down payment, and 580 FICO score qualifies you. So people were buying homes not to live in, and you could see the vacancy rates went up. They were just trying to buy it, flip it, make some money. Today, it's very different. You don't have that speculation. You have all-time low vacancy rates for both. So unlike here, where you had nobody living in there, no income coming in, today, you've got renters with income coming in, and you've got people living in it, so they're going to use it. Another big point is if you want to compare this to the housing bubble, well, look at inventory. In 2007, there were 4 million units for sale. Today, there's 1 million units for sale. And our population's grown by 30 million more people. So Folks, how are you going to have a bubble when you have 30 million more people fighting for 3 million fewer units? It just doesn't happen. But that doesn't even tell the whole story because, yeah, there's a million units in inventory, but the market's so hot, 45% of them are already under contract. So there's only 582,000 homes for sale in this country of 340 million people. That is less than half of what we've been accustomed to over the past decade. Now, affordability is a big story too. So people will say, hey, it's not affordable. So therefore, the housing market's going to crash. Well, let's take a deeper dive. In 2021, if you were to buy a home with a $400,000 mortgage, the rate was about three and three quarters on average. So here was your payment. Now, as you go into 2022, we know that from 2021 to 2022, prices appreciated in 2022 by 6%. So that's right. In 2022, home values appreciated. I know so many people during 2022 say it was going to be a crash, a bubble. No, prices went up 6%. So that means you'd need a higher mortgage as well. So that's going to hurt us right now. Instead of a $400,000 mortgage to buy a home, I got to take out 424 and the rate six and three quarters. Okay. So my payment's up 900 bucks a month. And that's what people stop and they say, ah, it's not affordable, but let's go deeper. Fannie Mae tells us the average income for this people were, these people were $9,000 a month household income. 
And ADP said that incomes went up 7% that year. So that means that your income went up by 630 bucks a month while the cost was 900. So you're still down, but not as much as you thought. Now I want to be fair about this. And I want to say, let's count for the inflation that has happened over the last year and a half. So we've had gas, food, and other things cost a family 250 bucks a month more. So the total increase is like 1150. You're only making 630. And, and this is the problem now is that people are upside down compared to 2021 it's $500 less affordable than it was then. Okay, except that incomes are still going up. A lot of forecasts for the income this year to go up, probably in the neighborhood of 6%. But let's say if it only goes up 5%, that's $482 a, a month more that you're making, which means that you've essentially washed out all of the problem that you've had with affordability during 2023. So affordability is going to be roughly the same as it was in 2021, and you know what the market looked like. Now, listen, what if the fundamentals return, and what if rates do come back? What if we do get into a recession and rates go to five and three quarters? Well, now you're 500 bucks a month cheaper, cheaper than it was for a family in 2021. Just do the math. Because while the payment's gone up, because the rate's gone up from three and three quarters to five and three quarters, the income's gone up more than that. Not even counts the inflation. So you can make a mathematical case that this year, it'll be a lot cheaper to buy a home than it was in 2021. See, a lot of people just get hung up and they say, oh, like, you know what? Rates, I'm sorry, appreciation and home values have gone up. Look at 2020. They went up 10%. 2021, 19%. 2022, 6%. It's got to stop. It's got to crash, right? Well, when you combine these three years and you do the compounding, it's almost 40% in three years. Like, oh my gosh. But the thing of it is, is that's that's happened before. You know, home values in the last 81 years, they've gone up 73 of those years, down seven and tied once right here. You see, if you go back here, home values went up 118 percent in six years. Did it crash? Well, if you waited for it to crash, you waited a long time because you waited 43 years. Then it just took a breather one percent and then it went up another 14 years. In fact, during that time, it spent six years going up another 93 percent during that period. And then went up big time here over the next 14 years. Now, yes, everybody points to this period. But what were the differences? As I mentioned to you, inventory, very different. The amount of population was less. The demographics were different. And the lending standards, quite different than they are today. So what I want you to understand is that just because values went up does not mean they have to come down. In fact, we have turned the table. Now, after peaking in June of 2022, home prices did come down a little bit. It depends on where you are. Nationwide. Now, the, the worst areas were like areas like Austin that was down to like 11% from the peak, from the very peak. But overall in the United States, they were down about 2.5% from the peak, but that is starting to turn. We are seeing already January was the transition month. And these are all the different measurements. Case Shiller, FHFA, CoreLogic, Black Knight, Zillow. And you can see... January was kind of like somewhere up slightly, somewhere down slightly. But in February, all of them showed appreciation and they were accelerating. In March, all of them showed appreciation and accelerating. In April, we don't have Case Shiller and FHFA yet. They lag a little bit. They report later. But in the ones that have reported, big appreciation, big appreciation. I mean, look, 1.2% per year. You're talking about, I'm sorry, 1.2% in a month. That's like 15% a year. This is like 18% a year. So you're seeing big numbers in appreciation that are happening right now. The tide is turning. In fact, the last time the market bottomed out in the year after it bottomed out was 2012. Prices went up 8% that year, but that was with 2.4 million units in inventory. Today, as I mentioned before, a million. Now, last year, we gave our housing forecast and we told everybody we thought it was 5.5% appreciation. We were actually a little bit understated because it came in at six. So we missed it slightly, but we were close, close to a bullseye. Now, this year, our forecast counts for lower inflation and recession-like slowdown. Incomes are going to increase, like I showed you. Inventory, as I showed you, is tight. And look, rents are no picnic. Our forecast is 5.8% appreciation in 2023. And you, it'll be positive. I promise you that. How close we are to our 5.8%, you know, we still have half the year left. But I do think that we'll see good, strong appreciation. So, Barry, you just told me that I should probably wait, right? Because rates are going to come down. So maybe I shouldn't buy a home today. 
No. And let me show you why. Because that's something that people will say, well, maybe I'll just wait. There's a cost to waiting. I picked Palm Beach County, Florida, because the appreciation is pretty modest. This is a tool we have in MBS Highway that'll show you what the cost would be to wait. And in order to do that, we have the appreciation for every single zip code. And in this zip code, over the next six months, prices are going to go up about 2%. And over the next 12 months in total, they're going to go up about 3%. So 2% over the next six months, then another 1% in the six months that follows. So if I can get, let's say, 6.5% rate with one point or so right now, should I wait a year, a, a six months or wait a year for rates to come down? The answer is no. And here's why. Because, yes, it is true that if you waited six months, your payment would drop by $421 a month. Or if you waited a year, it would drop by $380 a month. The reason for the difference there is because the property value would go up. So making it a little more expensive. But you would lose appreciation and you'd lose amortization. So when you think about the total you'd, you'd lose in appreciation and amortization, it would still be worth it to purchase it now by a big amount. Because look, if I'm going to make $25,000 in appreciation and amortization in six months, I'll just refi when rates come down and pay the $3,000. And yes, it's true. I would have spent this money, this four twenty one dollars for six months. So that's $25,26. I'm still ahead of the game, almost $20,000 in six months by not waiting. And remember, I picked an area with very modest appreciation. $30,000 if I wait a year. Don't wait. Do it now. But you got to show people this. And the market's heating up. Look, guys. When you take a look at, a pre at at homes that are bid over asking price, look at what's happened since January. We are now at 33% and rising of the amount of properties that are bid over ask. That's one out of three transactions. This is a problem for your real estate agent because the customer doesn't know how to evaluate it. And they're saying, should I chase it? Should I not? Let me show you how to show them. So, okay, you've got a home. It's worth 580. The asking price is 585. And in order to get it, because it's a hot market, you got to bid $15,000 on top of the 585. So you got to give them 600,000. The customer is hesitant to do so. But here's the main question in this particular market, in this zip code, how long will it take for that 580 value to be worth 600? And you can do that for them. We've got a tool that shows that. And in this case, the break even is eight months. Well, if it takes you two months to close, that means six months after I'm in, I'm broken even. And again, this is a very modest appreciation rate of 2.95% per year. Over the five years, you're going to make an extra $131,000 on top of that. Man, maybe I should bid $600,000 for this home at 585 list. Maybe I should. But without the benefit of this, how does your customer know whether they should or shouldn't do it? You show them, they get the deal, they make the money, and your realtor gets the sale. And every single transaction after that, that realtor wants to work with you. You just can't go in there with some bagels and say, please give me a deal. You have to show them how you're going to make them more money and how you're going to create value. If you just do just a couple of things I showed you, more realtors will do business with you. But this is the biggest one I'm about to show you right now. And this is the game changer for you for both purchases and refinances. This is what you have to do. First, understand that our personal savings rate before the recession and pandemic in 2020 was about 10%. We got stimulus one, two, and three here, but we've drained our savings to where it's less than 5% savings rate. Our credit card balances were skyrocketing before the pandemic, but then we got that big stimulus check. The economy was shut down, so we used the stimulus to pay down our credit cards. But since the economy's opened up and since we've ran out of stimulus two and three, we now started draining our savings and jacking up our credit cards. Here was the previous all-time high. We've gone crazy, but it's worse than that because a year ago we were paying 14% on our credit cards. Now it's 22%. So our credit card balances, as well as the bills, have skyrocketed. Our car payments have doubled in the past three years, averaging 800 bucks. But that doesn't tell the full story because now we've got six-year car loans. And one out of six car loans is over 1000 bucks a month. What's the solution? The solution is the equity in homes. The average LTV is 42 the average amount of equity somebody has in their home is $231,000. And the amount that they could pull cash out on a cash out refi on average is $185,000. Holy cow. That's a lot of money. So here's the question. When your customer says, hey, I don't want to give up my 3% rate. Is your rate really 3%? Well, let's say they have a 3% rate. 
and today's rate, maybe it's six and a half percent, one point, something like that. Okay. I, look, maybe the rate's three and a half, whatever. They bought their home a few years ago, had their mortgage of $400,000, but their home's gone up in value. Their balance of their loan through normal amortization has gone down. So they've got equity. And if they want to buy a home, it's going to cost the money that they'll have to pull out to sell. So they got to pay selling costs on this. So the equity that they have after paying to sell their home, a 6% fee, is $317,000. Now, most people would take that whole thing and put it down on a new home, except you got to account for the closing cost on the new home. Let's call it 12000 bucks. So that leaves them 305000 So they need the home. Their kids need the space. They want a yard. They need the room. They want the neighborhood. Whatever it is that they want, it's going to cost them more. And their dream home, they're going to go up to an $850,000 home. They normally would take the whole down payment, the whole amount of cash from the house, and roll it in and take out a 545 mortgage. That's just what people do. The problem is they say, well, that's going to mean my monthly payment is going to go up 2500 bucks a month because the rate's higher and the mortgage amount's higher. And hate giving up that 3% rate. But like most people, they have a ton of debt. So that's why we take this and we use the rate blended calculator, the blended rate calculator, because while they think they have a 3% rate, when you take into consideration what you're paying on your Visa, MasterCard, Discover, Macy's, and Nordstrom, your blended rate might be a lot higher than you think. Yeah, true, 3% on your mortgage. But what if you don't have just a mortgage? What if you got a car loan? What if you got that? Do the math for them and you'll discover that their rate's a lot higher. Now that you've done that, here's what we say. Well, look, the way you were thinking about doing it, yeah, it's $2,500 a month more because you're going to take all that money, that $305,000, and put it down on the home. What I'm saying is put down less. See, that would have given you a 64 LTV. I could take you up to an 80 LTV with no MI. So why don't you just put less down, take a bigger mortgage, and use the cash to wipe this out? When you do, now you're at a 72 LTV and your monthly payment difference is only $560. Now, I know it's still a difference, but heck, folks, we've been seeing so many of these come through where the payment's actually gone down on the new home, even though the rate's gone up from three and a half to six and three quarters. This is what your realtor needs because this is the thing that your realtor is suffering with. They desperately need to make people make the move and give up their low rate mortgage. That's all you're hearing in the news. This is the only solution. Now, if somebody doesn't have any debt, it doesn't work. Okay. But most people have debt and some people have a ton of debt. Remember, how many loans do you need? Do you need a million loans? No. If you do one loan a week, that's over $200,000 a year. You might be able to get a couple of loans a month from this strategy. You might make a realtor your best friend if you show them that you were able to turn a zero into a commission for them. Remember, if you do just two loans a month, you're in the top 15% of income earners in the entire United States. This is a strategy that works. Now take the same strategy and look at it on a, re on a refi. There is 1.3 million refinances being done. I promise you, the vast majority are all cash out refis. If you go to any of these call centers, any of them, this is all they're doing and they're killing it right now. You, look, you talk to people that are out there in, in, in the world of, of getting referrals from realtors, and they're saying, oh, it's really slow, it's really slow. And you talk to somebody in a call center and say, well, it's not slow because this is what they're focused on. You have to just take that mentality and crush it. Look, you bought your home three years ago. Today, your home's worth more. Through normal amortization, your home the loan balance has gone down. Their current rates, let's say three and three quarters because they refinanced in 2021. So they got a year and a half left. The, the rate today, let's just say it's a little higher than this or right around six and three eighths at one point, whatever. Their closing costs are 3000 bucks. So what, what the uh, thing that they're looking to do is maybe by the refinance to go from their, their low rate to this rate, it's going to cost them $588,000 a month. It doesn't pay. However, they got all of this in tappable equity. See, their LTV is a 56. I could take them to a 75 and we'll show you the amount of money that there's in this white space. It's 127,000. Let's use some of this 127,000 and wipe out the 56,000 in debt. So let's raise the mortgage amount, do a cash out refi, get rid of the debt. And now I'm saving you $1,058 a month, saving you. That's equivalent to working 
at making twenty four, twenty five thousand dollars a year, folks, depending on where you live. That's like having dinner with my family or having to work Uber at night. Twenty five thousand dollar a year raise you gave them. Now, if they don't need that money and it's found money, which it really is, why not take it and apply it towards principal? You apply it towards principal, and now your new mortgage is not thirty years; it's fourteen years and nine months. And compared to the twenty eight and a half years you had remaining on the existing loan you have, you're going to save 13 and three quarter years. You're going to save 165 payments of everything. Because right now you might be paying $5,000 a month for your mortgage and all those credit cards. Well, 14 years and nine months from now, guess what you're paying? Zero. If you kept it the way it is, you're still paying $5,000 a month for 165 months. It's like the best retirement plan in history. Now you don't have to wait 14 years and nine months because you start saving money every single month. After five years, you built up a guaranteed $62,000, guaranteed. You, 10 years from now, you've saved $156,000, guaranteed. And in 14 years and nine months, when you have no mortgage left and you're debt-free, completely debt-free, you've saved $282,000, guaranteed. Why do I keep saying guaranteed? Because all you got to do is make the payment. It doesn't matter what Bitcoin does, what the Dow does, what the NASDAQ does, what the bomber. You just make your payment under this strategy, and this is how much you have. It's not the rate. It's the wealth. And that's what you're doing for people, is you're creating wealth because you're just doing it smarter. At 7%, somebody just sent this, and they saved somebody $3,000 a month. Folks, there are people that need your desperate help. Look, there's a lot of misconceptions right now, right now, and that's holding people back too. You know, In your marketing, I want you to think about this that the National Association of Realtors, they did a study and they, they found out that only 11% of first-time home buyers knew that they could buy a home with 5% down. Only 11, 89% think you need more than 5% to put down. Almost half of them think you need 20% down. So they're not even engaging with a realtor, with a mortgage professional. So don't get too fancy in your, in your marketing. Hey, do, a, do an Instagram reel and tell people you can do it with a low down payment and save them money and get them into home ownership because that's what creates wealth. It's an important segment because 40% of all sales with a mortgage or to a first-time home buyer. 40%. That's a lot. How do we show that? Do a buy versus rent comparison. $500,000 home, 10% down. Let's assume a 6.5% rate with one point, and let's assume rates never come down. Okay, so uh, kind of crazy to think that. Eventually, they'll come down. They could refinance it. But let's say they never refi, and they're going to be there for nine years. Now, let's give you all the negatives. Your property taxes, they may not go up, but let's just assume that they go up 2% a year. And how about repair costs? Let's assume your landlord would pay it if you're renting, but if you own, let's put aside 2,500 bucks a year for repairs. And then the cost to sell, not on today's value, but on what the value would be, let's figure 6% on what the value would be nine years from now and assume a historical average of 4.65% appreciation. Now, let's just say you're a great negotiator and instead of $4,000 a month for rent, you get it down to 3,700, but your rent does go up 4% a year. Should I buy or should I rent? Well, it's an easy one, Barry. I should rent because my payment's 300 bucks a month cheaper. That's what they're going to say. Except it's really not because look at the rent. It goes up every year. And just at 4%, by the third year, you're paying about the same to rent as you would to own. But then after that, it goes up. In fact, over the nine years, you'd save $33,000 by buying. But folks, the big point here, this is not cheaper. You are not $300 a month cheaper. Let me show you why. Because your payment of principal and interest of twenty eight forty four, let's break it down. And that's why we put an amortization schedule next to it that you could pull up on MBS Highway. Interest, you can get a tax break on this. I'm not even counting that. Principal is your own money. And that's $407 from month one. And then it goes up. So right from the first month, you're not $300 cheaper. You're $100 more expensive by renting, but nobody looks at that. And this principle adds up over the nine years, it's $59,000. And then what about appreciation? At just the historical average, 4.65 over nine years, compounded annually, tough one to figure out. That's why Albert Einstein said it's the eighth wonder of the world. So we do it for you in this tool. It's $252,000. Wow, $252,000. Now, what you do is you have to sell and pay a realtor 6% on that 752 purchase the value of the home because it's gone up from 500 but you get a tax break so your bottom line is you save three hundred and five thousand dollars, folks three hundred and five thousand dollars better off and that's saying you never refinanced and you got the rent 300 bucks a month cheaper now in the first year you notice you're worse off by 
$23,000 because the cost to buy and the cost to sell if you were to sell in the first year. But if you're going to do that, then rent. If you're going to be there less than two years, rent. If you're going to be there longer than two years, why in the world are you not buying this home? Show your realtor, co-brand it with them. What would I be doing if I was a mortgage professional today? This is what I'd be doing. You know what else? I'd be showing people that if you want to be in the top 1% of net worth, you need $10.8 million, according to a Kiplinger study. Top 2%, you need $2.5 million. 5%, $1 million. Top tier, top 10%, you need $800,000. And the top 50%, you need a half a million dollars. But the Kiplinger study said that two-thirds of all net worth came from home equity. You can't get rich being a renter. you got to get in the real estate game no matter what the media is saying. Look at this. The average homeowner's net worth is 40 times what a net renter's net worth is. You want to get wealthier, you got to have real estate. It takes seconds to pull up our ABM. What would I be doing if I were doing loans right now? Mr. And Mrs. Realtor, if you were going to go out to list, let me help you. Let me show you an example on one of your listings. Here's an ABM. I looked at your listings. I pulled up an ABM, and here's what I could show you. Here's all the homes in the neighborhood. Here's your home. Wouldn't this be great to bring with you to show what the value is to keep the people grounded when you present them with what you think they should sell their home for? On top of that, I'll show you in a dynamic map where all the comps are to do the work for you to save you time. On top of that, I'll give you a report that shows trends in the neighborhood. So it looks even more professional. Wow. What else will I give you? A real estate report card that answers all the questions your clients want. What's the employment situation? What's the appreciation historically? What's it look like? How much money should they make on this home? What is the demographics? What's the inventory? What's the rental situation? How many homes are in demand versus how many are being built? What's the affordability? What's the unemployment rate? What's the income? Everything they want to know, I'll co-brand it with you. What would I be doing right now? I would do this. <clears throat> Just like the Art of War in Sun Tzu where he says, Every battle is won or fought before it's ever is won or lost before it's ever fought. I would say to that realtor, listen, the next time you go on a listing appointment, why don't you bring these with you to show how you're going to market in open houses, how you're going to market on social media, what you're going to present to every prospective buyer. Or if it's a buying agent, here's what I think you could show every prospective buyer. This is what we want to be doing today. And folks, of course, we alert you. We give you an incredible morning update that will educate you, that will make you better every single day. And one of the things that you might want to take a look at is we just did this, this loan comparison tool. It is freaking amazing what it does. The loan comparison is better than any other because it also has appreciation data. It is the best tool for this that you can imagine. We have appreciation data. We have all kinds of tools that no one else has. But the other thing you could do is you could also add video, you could do screen share, or you could do a narration. Why is that so important? Because while you're presenting, you could have a little video that narrates it. Heck, if you want to just have the video, you could do that yourself. So there are other tools that charge you a lot to just do video messages. It's included. There are things like Zoom that you got to pay for. Well, you've got a screen share and a, and a meeting that you have within the tool. And of course, the narration that you have. So this is an amazing thing for you to have included. How much is MBS Highway? It's really cheap. It's 200 bucks a month or $2,000 a year. You could save some money. But there's a discount because of what you have going on today here at Flagstar that saves you 40% on either one. That 40% savings means it costs you 119 bucks a month. Look, I know money's tight, but what does it cost not to have it? I mean, really, what, what's for, for, for 25, 30 bucks a week? You, know, you can't even get lunch for that once a week. This is tax deductible. Email Diana at highway.ai, Diana at highway.ai to take advantage and save money on this. Folks, the time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy is a great quote by Sir John Templeton. And it is really the best time to buy right now. Remember that article by American Banker? Is it time to quit mortgage and real estate? Yes, all the statistics were true. But the one thing I failed to tell you was the article was written in 2014. Yeah, that's right. Very similar market. If you quit in 2014, you missed the best eight-year run in the history of this industry. Now, I don't know what the next eight years has or next year has, but I know it's going to get better. And I know if you do the things to make yourself better, you will be very, very successful. Don't you dare think about quitting. This is a time for you to engage, to grab market share, and to position yourself to do even better. Now, if you want to stay in touch with me, well, first of all, some of you, thank you for purchasing my book. You made it a number one bestseller. It's about finding opportunities. It's a trained and learned way to do things. It's a skill. I have a lot of stuff on Instagram that's reels that you could take, you could swipe, you could post, you could share on all these things that are very, very easy for you to use and articulate some of these topics. 
So just follow me on Instagram and you can go ahead and grab and share all that stuff. I am Barry Habib on Instagram. Now, I know we're just on call time right now, John. I've got like like one minute. I want to just show something else because it's really exciting. Yeah, sure. If you guys have both MBS Highway and 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 um, list reports, which we acquired list reports, we just released this. It's a new tool because what you want to do is you want to protect and grow your agents, right? So what do I do? I want to keep my current agents from being poached and I want to protect in those guys, but I also want to build new agents. So most mortgage professionals, they'll talk to any agent you know, and, and take them out to lunch just because they'll talk to them. But who knows who they're sending their business to? What type of business do they do? They do any business at all. And if they do business, is it all listings? So just text your realtor's name to Agent Connect. Don't worry because we will zero in using AI to know who they are because we'll base it based on where you do your business. We'll send you their picture and their info, including how many transactions they do, buy side transactions, listing transactions, types of business that they do, government, conventional, whatever it is. So now you gain some intel, but who's your competitors? Here's who they're sending it to. Look, if all their business goes to their husband or their wife, well, I'm not taking you out to lunch. But here you have the company and the loan officer that they send their business to so you know who your competition is. Now, here's their active listings. If they don't have any active listings, let's find a recent transaction that they've done because they have to have transactions because this is somebody that is doing business already. We want to find something that's active or something that's recent because I don't want to show you a sample of what I could do for you. I want you to trigger your reticular activator. You know, when you just purchased a car, you notice every car like that on the road kind of jumps out at you. You take notice, you, you, your brain is gravitated towards it. That's your reticular activator. So we want to trigger that here. So you click on this and what happens? Here's the pieces we're going to send you. Some of the stuff you already saw and there's more things too. You can review those. And then we'll say, okay, we know that you do business with them or if this is a new connection for you. So we'll structure it that way, but we'll double check to make sure we're right. Now, we'll also create a cover letter for you so you don't have to do anything. Here's a cover letter. I want to introduce myself, show you an example. I've helped top performing agents gain more listings, important sale, and better motivate buyers to see the opportunity using these tools. And then we say, okay, now that you've sent them all this stuff, here's the things that they're going to be getting. How do we follow up with them? Here's where they are. Here's where they do their business. Here's things you could say. These are people that you have in common in social media. Here is people that you've worked with. Congratulations, you're in the top 15%. And if you want to meet this person in person, here's where they're going to be because we know where their open houses are. Folks, this is the stuff that really will help you in this industry right now. I started off by saying, what would I be doing today, right now? That's what I'd be doing right now. And just email Diana at highway.ai and she'll get you started. Yeah, hey, Barry, uh, there's a lot of questions, but I think you really touched on all of them, quite honestly, as you were going through the presentation. There's some conversations in there about the 2006 uh, household formations. Obviously, you talked about that throughout the presentation. There was a lot on uh, kind of jobs report and stuff like that. So you touched on that. One question that did come up just for somebody, and you could probably spend three seconds on this. Does the unemployment rate only go based off of who has filed for unemployment benefits? I know a lot of no, people have been laid off in the last year and they still haven't filed for unemployment. No, it's it's based on when you get the job, it's based on the jobs report. There's two sides. There's a business survey that gives you job creations. And then there's the household survey where they actually call people and survey them. That's where you get the unemployment rate. And also they do have a job creation number. Look, last month we saw 339 job creations in the business survey. The household survey where they actually call people, not modeling, showed a loss of 313,000 jobs. I think the jobs numbers are much weaker than people think. Got it. Um, and then, hey, somebody uh, at the end, when you were kind of going over MBS Highway and the offer for the event, somebody asked, um, how long will that offer last? Like if they sign up a week from now, is, is that good? Or do they need to do it in a certain time period? Well, typically, typically it's day of the event yeah. to get the forty percent off. But you know, look, if, if you need a day or two, it, well, you know, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna be. There you go. Yeah, cool. Um, and look, I think you really touched on everything else, quite honestly, Barry, in, in great detail as you were going through it, because the questions were popping up in advance of some of your slides as you were talking about topics. Um, yeah, somebody asked about the repeat why depositors taking money out. I don't know if you need to do that. I mean, you talked about it fairly, you know, in that whole slide and that came up just as you were talking about it. So, man, I think we touched on almost everything. There's a lot of comments, right? Like, hey, great, in you know, obviously great information. U.S. Secretary Treasurer needs to have a term on its seat. They have stuff like that. Um, 
which I think is actually kind of you know interesting as far as comments go. So I think we pretty much touched on everything, Barry, in the comments section. Thank you, John. Questions. Thank you, everyone. It's been it's been an honor to be here with you guys. God bless you guys and be well. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Appreciate it, buddy. Bye. Well, hey, gang, look, these flex series, when we started them, right, it was always about trying to add value. And I think we've had some really good uh, guest speakers. Uh, I, you know, I put Barry up there at the top, uh, you know, as one of our best ones always. I think this is the second or third time he's come on and done this for us. And what I love about Barry is it's, it's there's the emotion and the passion of, you know, what we do for a living, right, being an originator. But I love how Barry takes the emotion out of it, right? Like, forget about what's going on in the media and how the spin is doom and gloom. And he just breaks it down into the data, the statistics, the historical data, right? When you see those charts about what happens going into a recession, what happens coming out of a recession, what, why are we going into a recession? What happens with housing prices coming out of a recession? I mean, it doesn't lie, right? And, and and look, this job's emotional, what we do, right? Like as he mentioned, we're seeing, you know, volume at, you know, uh, less than what we saw in the pandemic. But there's opportunity in these, in these, in these, uh, this time in this market, right? So I will tell you one other thing. So I've known Barry for a very long time. I think I've been in this industry for 28 years and I've known him for a very long time. And I'm just going to say two things. Number one, if, you, if you're not a subscriber to MBS Highway, you really need to assess, especially with the break that Barry's given for attending our event today, becoming a subscriber. Because, I mean, look, my second point will be something about MBS Highway. But even if you don't use it for all the tools that Barry talked about, the daily updates and what you get and the locked alerts, that pays for itself, right? Number one. Number two, I'm always amazed when I talk to people that are followers of Barry's and are, you know, MBS Highway subscribers. I ask them, have you, do you use the tools he talks about? Have you used the rent versus buy analysis? Have you used the report cards? Have you done all this stuff to grow your business? And, and look, a lot of people do, but a lot of people don't. And Barry's team behind the scenes, they will work with you. They'll train you. I mean, it is easy, right? And, and in this environment, Barry talks about it, bringing value to your referral sources, your real estate partners. That's what separates you from your competition. So I highly encourage you to take a look at it. Obviously, you know, Barry, a good friend of Flag Stars, And because of the event today, you're getting a break. Um, and then look, the powerful tools, even the stuff he just mentioned at the end, it's all brand new. Like think about what he just showed you in, in that last minute or two here. So I highly encourage you to do that. He's obviously a supporter of this industry. And he's trying to help in any way he can. And look, the MBS Highway and the tools that they have are phenomenal. So, uh, look, with that being said, uh, we are actually taking a break in July. Um, obviously, the July 4th holiday is the week that we would normally do it. So we're not going to do it then. And then we would normally do it the following week. We have a sales rally where uh, myself and the entire organization will be at a sales rally in, in that week. So we won't be able to do it then. And then, look being mindful of next week of the month, refinances, purchases, getting them out the door. We're going to take a break in July. And the next one will be in August, August 17th at 2 p.m. And we're lining up, uh, you know, a really good speaker from that standpoint and the content that we'll have for you there. But hopefully you got something out of this. Barry's always great. Uh, again, we can't say thank you enough for taking the time. We appreciate your partnership at Flagstar. We know you have choices and we need to earn your business. Uh, and as always, Hopefully this uh, was beneficial for you and we appreciate your partnership. Have a great day, guys.